Okay, so welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the, the cake. I have to compliment you for your singing. Was <laughs> was very nice. Um, we now proceed to one of the highlights of this symposium, namely the award of the AZ Medal 2023. Uh, so most of you know the AZ Medal, but let me just br very briefly explain what the AZ Medal uh, is. So the AZ Medal is an award, a recognition for outstanding achievements in any field of mathematics and or physics. So it could be something that is of relevance in mathematics and physics. This is an idea that uh, we, together with the Scientific Advisory Board, came up with in um, 2019, and then we developed some rules. And in 2020, there was the first call for nominations for the uh, AZ Medal. The uh, nominations for the AZ Medal can come from um, former members of the Scientific Advisory Board, from organizers of thematic programs, from uh, AZ Senior Fellows, from um, uh, previous medalists, uh, and from the president of the AZ Association. So in uh, 2020, then we did the first AZ medal, and the first recipient was Anton Alexeyev. And we did again, the second recipient was Eldor Lieb. It was in 2021, and in 2022, uh, the uh, AZ medal went to Martin Haira. So we always, for all these medals, we had a nice symposium, and we have a nice symposium also today for the AZ medal uh, 2023, and the Scientific Advisory Board by uh, Sandra Di Rocco, um, um, awarded the AZ Medal 2023 to uh, Isabel Gallagher. And very, very great. <laughs> yes. So I, I won't say much about Isabel because Pierre Germain will give a laudatio about the work of uh, Isabel. Let me just say that I think that she is uh, an ideal recipient of the AZ Medal because her work, she's a mathematician, uh, but her work is also of relevance for physics. In, in fact, I think one can say that's inspired by physics. She has done uh, very important work on partial differential uh, equations and um, including nonlinear wave uh, equations and, and fluid fluid motion. She has worked on the Navier-Stokes equations on rotating fluids. That's obviously important because the Earth is an, a rotating object, and if one wants to understand fluid flow in the oceans and the, and the, the atmosphere, one needs to know how to deal with rotations. And she also worked on kinetic theory. In particular, she worked on uh, the Boltzmann equation where one of the goals is to understand how irreversibility arises from microscopically reversibly, reversible motion. We have heard about that before today. And of course, this, um, you know, the, 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 the equation that describes the dynamics of dilute ga gases was written down by Ludwig Boltzmann after whom this lecture hall is named. So this is also uh, the perfect place for uh, the AZ medal for I Isabel uh, Gallagher. So let me now just briefly explain the, the procedure. Um, first, we will hear about the work and life of Isabel Gallagher from uh, Pierre G Germain. And then I, we will hand over the AZ medal. I have it here in my pocket. We will uh, give you the, the medal and, the, and a nice certificate for your office uh, wall. Um, and, and then I will ask you to give your uh, award lecture. So first, uh, Pierre will talk about the work of um, Isabel. And Pierre Germain is a professor for uh, analysis and partial differential equations, can I say that, in, uh, at Imperial College in in London. He was actually a student of Isabel Gallagher. He obtained his PhD with, uh, with working with her, and then he moved around in the world. You were at Princeton and at the ETH, at the Current Institute, and uh, in, in Paris, and then you went back to the Current Institute as a professor. 
roughly. <laughs> <laughs> roughly. He did the Kroll Institute for, for a long time. You stayed there for a long time. So you, you, you were a professor at the Kroll Institute, and then very recently you um, became a professor at the Imperial College. And today, now we are going to learn from him about the work of our uh, medalist. So I have to switch here. Doesn't look completely good. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. Screen. Better. Better. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, so. Um, Indeed, I was, I was Isabel's student. Uh, I started my PhD with her uh, 20, 20 years ago, pretty much exactly. And so I'm, I'm uh, touched uh, to, to have a, a chance to, to speak of her work here today and to give this uh, laudatio for, for her. Uh, so I, I did learn um, quite a bit of mathematics from her. And I also learned uh, you know, how to think of mathematics, uh, this blend of physics and, and mathematics that she, that she likes. Uh, I learned how to, uh, how to find good problems, what to do when you're stuck, which, which happens, unfortunately. And so I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be able to, to celebrate her work today. Um, and I must say, when I, when I, when I told uh, colleagues that she would be getting that, that prize, everybody was really delighted and uh, telling me about you know, what she did, her results, uh, her role as, as a leader, and the um, impact she had on the community. So it was like a unanimous praise that I, that I heard uh, when, I, when I mentioned this, this prize. Um, so today, uh, I, I'm going to try and, and present um, her work uh, in uh, rather um, elementary terms or uh, not entering into details. Uh, so of course, it's, it's difficult because it's a very large body of work, very deep, many facets. Uh, so I tried to select a few important themes and some key theorems that I will state uh, precisely. And I will try to um, give some background uh, around, around these, these theorems. Um, so the, the three main directions I will, I will discuss are first, the, the Nalyasitox equation, uh, second, the Boltzmann equation, and uh, the third topic is maybe a, a less well-known um, aspect of her work, uh, which is harmonic analysis on Lie groups, and uh, particularly the uh, Heisenberg groups. Uh, so let's start with the, the Nalyasitox equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation is maybe the fundamental equation of fluid mechanics, and it's describing the motion of a viscous fluid. Uh, so uh, I wrote it down here. U is the velocity of the fluid. P is its pressure. Uh, this equation here expresses conservation of momentum, uh, incompressibility of the fluid, and you provide the system with data uh, from which you want to find a solution. And this picture uh, is meant to demonstrate how complicated fluid flow can, can become, uh, but we want to make sense of it. Um, so, of course, the Navier-Stokes problem is also one of the um, uh, fundamental problems of mathematics today. Um, and more specifically, the question that people would like to understand is whether it can develop singularities. One way to understand why it is difficult to answer this problem 
is to compare two uh, fundamental structures of the Navier-Stokes equation. First one is energy conservation. Uh, so uh, energy conservation tells you that, or I should say dissipation rather, uh, so the L2 norm of the velocity is decreasing and it's decreasing, it's decreasing at a rate given by the H1 norm of the, of the velocity. Uh, and this expresses that uh, kinetic energy is, is uh, dissipated by friction. So if you just follow the ideas around energy conservation, you see that the natural space to work with is L2, the energy space, because this is uh, the space that captures the kinetic energy. Um, also, what follows from this uh, differential equality or inequality is that you get a global control of the solution, namely you get a uniform bound on the L2 norm. So this translates naturally into global solutions. And here by global, I mean for all time. However, uh, though you control the L2 norm for all time, and though this gives global solutions, uh, this does not come with a better control that would give either smoothness or a uniqueness of the solution. And typically, the way you, you uh, build up uh, solutions uh, using energy conservation is by uh, compactness methods. And of course, this was pioneered by uh, Luray in the 30s and uh, Hopf in the, in the 50s. So that's plan A, is to rely on the energy structure of the equation. Plan B is to think of the scaling invariance of the equation. Uh, so this uh, transformation by which you rescale the size of the field and the space and time variables, uh, this scaling invariance of the equation uh, leaves so this transformation leaves solution invariant, and, and the natural space which is attached to this transformation is L3 in space, because the norm of L3 is invariant by this transformation. Um, unfortunately, this does not, that there is no global control coming with this uh, transformation. So you can only get local solutions uh, or global if you add a smallness assumption. However, if you rely on this uh, property of the equation, uniqueness holds, and, and typically you exploit this scaling invariance through a fixed point method. You just use the Banach fixed point theorem to uh, construct solutions. And uh, so the first instance of this was due to Fuji Takato, the uh, best implementation of this method uh, was done by Koch and Tatarut 20 years ago. Uh, so a way of phrasing the millennium problem is whether these two approaches can be reconciled, namely what you would like to keep from uh, the conservation of energy is the global control, and what you would like to keep from this scaling invariance is uh, uniqueness and thus the absence of singularity. And this is actually a general feature of what is called supercritical problems. That's a large class of problems in, in PDEs um, for which uh, the, the scaling invariance is too weak compared to the uh, conserved quantities of the equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation is the most prominent example, but there are plenty others in uh, nonlinear wave equations, uh, many, many different fields. Okay, so that's for the uh, very general background. And so um, what Isabel tried to do in her work is, was to see whether it's possible to go beyond these two uh, approaches that each have their strengths and their limitations. So in a series of works with uh, Jean-Yves Chemin, and uh, Maya Spaiku, she was able to construct global smooth solutions for data which are large in the uh, core and tataru space. What this means is 
though uh, the data are seemingly uh, too big to enable you to get smoothness for any time, uh, nevertheless, uh, she was able to uh, obtain global smooth solutions. So it's getting the best of, of both worlds, if you want. And, and the idea uh, relies on a deep analysis of, of the nonlinear structure of the equation, which of course uh, has much more to say than just uh, scaling invariance and energy conservation. Um, uh, in a paper with Fabrice Planchon, same idea, go beyond uh, the theorems of Loray and Cor and Tataru, she was able to uh, obtain global solutions, though the energy of these solutions was infinite, so seemingly there was no global control that would allow you to uh, obtain a solution valid for all time. And so there are deep ideas that I don't have time to, to go into. Okay, so this was for the plain uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Now, uh, let me turn to rotating fluids. And what I just said is, uh, I guess, the most abstract part of the lecture. Uh, I will now, I, I, I hope, be uh, less abstract. Uh, so rotating fluids uh, corresponds to the Navier-Stokes equation, the same as before to which you add this term, which is a uh, lower order, so it's, it's not a differential operator, uh, but which has a large parameter in front of it, so epsilon is small. Uh, and this accounts for the effect of uh, rotation, which is uh, predominant in many planetary flows. Obviously, this is Jupiter, but the same thing is true on the, on the Earth. And so one question is to understand what is the effect of uh, rotation on the dynamics of, of, of Navier-Stokes? So one idea is that uh, actually adding this rotation term to the Navier-Stokes equation uh, will simplify things for the following reason. Uh, in uh, rotating fluids, you have waves which propagate and uh, waves uh, they don't regularize things, but they add oscillations or they, uh, they add uh, spreading, which uh, helps with the nonlinear uh, terms in the equation. So if you look at the linearized problem, uh, this is the linearized problem. So I just dropped the convection term. And I also dropped the dissipation. This just captures uh, the... Um, Crosby waves, which are the waves in atmosphere uh, or in, in the atmosphere, yes, uh, that, that arise uh, through the uh, rotation of the Earth and the Coriolis force. So this is the linearized problem. And uh, waves, when they are in the, in the whole space, they, they spread, of course. And this spreading can be captured by uh, what we call decay and Strickard's estimates. So in the case of Rossby waves, uh, they were proved by uh, Chemin des Jardins, Gallagher, and Bernier. Uh, and you see, U is the solution. You see there is some decay depending on time, provided the solution, the data is, uh, so it should be U naught. The data is in the appropriate uh, Lebesgue space. This is the decay estimate, and the Strickard's estimate is a, a variation on that, on that theme. It also captures uh, the spreading of the waves, which translates into decay of the field. Um, so out of this um, decay property, uh, the same authors, uh, Chemin, Desjardins, Gallagher, Bernier, uh, were able to uh, prove that if you give me data in L2, if epsilon is sufficiently small, so if the rotation is sufficiently important, uh, then there exists a unique global solution to the uh, Navier-Stokes Coriolis uh, equation. So you see, this is achieving uh, what Loret solutions cannot do, 
you just have data that have finite energy. And nevertheless, you get a unique, global, and smooth solution to the uh, negative equation. And the idea of the proof is to view the problem as a perturbation. Uh, so this is the linear part, which, as we saw, uh, gives decay thanks to the spreading of the Rossby waves. Uh, and if the field decays sufficiently fast, the nonlinear term can be viewed as a perturbation of the linear part of the equation. And so you, you, you capture this decay property through the dispersive and Strickert estimate. And then uh, the nonlinear perturbation can be absorbed uh, by, by, by this uh, decay estimate. That's, uh, that's a, a wonderful result that shows how wave propagation can interact with uh, hydrodynamics and uh, propagation of fluids. Now, it seems that the same thing would not work on the torus, because on the torus, waves cannot propagate. I mean, they, they, they do propagate, sorry, uh, but they don't decay, right? If they're on the torus, on a, a compact set, they're just wrapping around the torus, and no decay can be expected. Nevertheless, uh, Chemin, Desjardins, Gallagher, and Grenier were able to uh, obtain the same result if the data has finite energy and if epsilon is sufficiently small, then there exists a unique global solution. So that's a very surprising result. And actually, the idea is to take advantage of the oscillations that are provided by this uh, small parameter epsilon. So though waves don't decay, they still do oscillate. And through these oscillations, uh, you can extract a, a limiting system and then there are many, many more uh, ideas. But this is really the key uh, physical idea that enables uh, these authors to, to prove this theory. OK. So uh, this is, this is uh, all I wanted to say about fluids. Isabel has many other uh, wonderful results on these. Um, but I want to turn now on the Boltzmann, to the Boltzmann equation. Um, so the great idea of Boltzmann was to substitute to Newtonian um, dynamics uh, a new equation. And um, so his idea was to go from um, microscopic description. So the microscopic description would be if you have a gas of particles with a large number of particles, you just record for each particle its position and velocity, and then particles interact through collisions. And after each collision, you update the position and velocity, and you keep track of just everybody in the system. So this was uh, Newtonian dynamics, which, of course, if n is very large, is not very practical. The idea of Boltzmann was to switch to a mesoscopic description that is, rather than recording all particles, just uh, think of the density of particles with a, a given position and velocity. And of course, a big question is, how do you go from uh, Newtonian dynamics to the Boltzmann description of, of a, such a system? This is Boltzmann's equation that I wanted to write. Uh, so it's, it's scary. There is here a transport equation. And here there is a collision operator. So this tells you how particles just uh, travel as, as long as they don't collide. And this gives the uh, cumulative effect of collisions on uh, changing the, the velocity of, of particles. And this operator is this complicated uh, integral operator uh, that I, I, I don't have time to say much about. So uh, Hilbert, in his uh, sixth problem, asked about the axiomatization of physics. And he specifically mentioned uh, 
the derivation of Boltzmann equation to describe uh, gases. And so the question that Hilbert was, Hilbert was raising was how do you go from the Newtonian end body problem to the Boltzmann equation? So this uh, question was answered first by Lanford uh, 40 years ago in a famous uh, paper, but that was very short and in many places quite sketchy. Uh, and then uh, Isabelle uh, Lorsaramon and Benjamin Texier uh, provided a full proof uh, around 10 years ago, showing that if you take um, and particles of size epsilon in the proper uh, scaling, the solutions to the end body problem, so Newtonian dynamics with a uh, large number of particles, converge to solutions of the Boltzmann equation. The proof is, is very deep and it has to do with um, expanding the solution in a series. But one uh, very pedestrian way to say it is that you want to record, uh, find a way to record how particles collide and what is the uh, collision history of each particle. With this particle, it undergoes one collision, another collision, and it ends up uh, here. Uh, so you, you want to find an efficient way to uh, represent this sort of uh, uh, dynamics. But then, uh, Isabelle, with her collaborators, went further. Uh, and to explain how you can go further, I want to tell you about uh, elementary uh, probability, just the sum of random variables. So you take the simplest setup in probability, uh, you just take uh, a bunch of IID Bernoulli random variables, so uh, coin flips, uh, that give you plus or minus one with equal probability, and you ask about the behavior of the sum. Okay, so uh, step zero is the law of large numbers, which tells you that almost surely the average goes to zero. And that's basically common sense. The next step is the central limit theorem. This is not uh, obvious anymore. This is not common sense. And this is giving you the next order. So now if you rescale properly, now you divide by one over root m. Uh, this sum of random variables does not go to zero anymore. It goes to this universal object, which is uh, the Gaussians. Okay. Uh, so I think both of these theorems are like 18th century. And the next step is uh, large deviations, which were developed uh, in particular by Varadhan uh, in the last uh, 40 years. Um, and now you, you ask about extreme events. Uh, how is it possible, for instance, that this uh, sum is unusually large? And then you have yet another um, behavior that you observe. Uh, there is typically this sort of, of law with a specific S that depends on the exact um, nature of the, of the random variables. So what's the connection with the Boltzmann equation? Well, the Boltzmann equation corresponds to this average behavior, right? Uh, if, if you think of it in terms of probability, because uh, this is a very a chaotic system that has uh, random features, uh, the Boltzmann equation is just giving you the first order of description, but you'd be interested in, in knowing what is uh, the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem, it's telling you uh, how do you depart from equilibrium on average? And then you'd like to know about extreme events, which is uh, large deviations. Uh, so the low, low large numbers is Boltzmann's equation. Uh, the central limit theorem, so telling you about the fluctuations around, around this uh, average motion, uh, it was proposed by Spohn for, um, for the um, Boltzmann equation. So the fluctuations uh, solve uh, stochastic uh, differential equation. 
So this is the fluctuations. This is the linearized operator around the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And this is a Gaussian noise, roughly speaking. Uh, so this was spawned in the 80s, I think. Uh, and there was also a large deviation principle uh, which was proposed by Reza Hanlou uh, around the same time. Uh, so both of these results are, uh, were just uh, uh, heuristic. And I'm not attempting to write the large deviation principle. It's, it's a more complicated formula. Uh, so uh, very recent achievement of Isabel with Bodino, Saint-Raymond, and Simonella uh, just a few years ago was to make rigorous these two, uh, these two results, uh, which seemed uh, uh, completely out of reach. I remember talking to uh, Reza Hanlou, who was surprised that it was uh, feasible. Uh, so they, 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 they were able to provide rigorous proofs. And uh, so this is a bit beyond my uh, competence, but my understanding is that the, the key idea is to pay particular attention to recollisions. So what happens if two particles that have collided in the past do again collide in the future? Uh, understanding precisely uh, this sort of events, which are rare but uh, significant, uh, understanding precisely this sort of events is, is key to uh, proving these theorems. I, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. <laughs> okay. uh, all right, so uh, to conclude, I would like to uh, discuss this, this last uh, direction in, in, on which Isabel worked, uh, which is harmonic analysis on Lie groups, uh, and in particular on uh, the Heisenberg group. Um, so, so this is, uh, I guess, more abstract, and, and the connection to, 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 to physics is, is less um, evident, but these are very beautiful questions that I would like to, to discuss. Uh, so let us review uh, some of the um, main results in harmonic analysis in the Euclidean space over the last 100 years. Uh, so one very important result is the Sobolev embedding theorem in the 40s uh, that enables you to bound the LP norm of a function if you know the LQ norm of its derivatives. And of course, uh, P, Q, and S have to be uh, properly chosen. That's the Sobolev embedding theorem. Um, another very important theorem is, is due to Strickart in the 70s, and then there was a considerable development. Now you're asking for um, the solution of the uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, so uh, this is the Schrodinger group, and you apply it to a function f. Uh, so obviously, the solution equation gives waves that are going to, to spread. And this translates into a certain integrability uh, that can be measured in time and in space. So first you take the LQ norm in space, and then you take the LP norm in time. And since waves are spreading, this is finite as long as you choose P and Q uh, correctly. And you bound this by uh, the norm of F in So this, this class of estimates uh, was uh, first uh, put forward by Strickart, and, and then it, it had a huge uh, success. Uh, and around the same time, and uh, actually there are many uh, connections between these two uh, questions, around the same time, uh, Stein came up with the uh, Fourier restriction problem. Uh, so it's, it's a, a bit more complicated to explain. The idea is that you look at a function which is supported on the unit uh, sphere. So not on the ball, but on the sphere, which is the boundary of the ball. Uh, so this is the measure on the unit sphere. And G is the uh, density with respect to this uh, sphere. 
Okay, so you have a function that is supported on the unit sphere with a certain density, and you take uh, the inverse Fourier transform, and you want to bound this in LQ as uh, provided that the density G is in L2 or more generally in some other LP space. So this is more uh, complicated to state, and this seems less immediately important, but these sorts of, of inequalities have uh, uh, monopolized the attention of harmonic analysts for the last uh, 40 years. Not monopolized, but at least they've been very important uh, to us. Okay, so th these are uh, three important directions. Uh, so the two first are fully understood, and the third, uh, completely understanding this is still a major open problem on the Euclidean space. Um, and one thing you can observe is that uh, all of these inequalities can be formulated either through the Laplacian or the Fourier transform. And both are more or less equivalent, uh, I mean, are completely equivalent on the, on the Euclidean space. And so what Isabel set out to do was to see you know, what happens to these fundamental inequalities if you change the geometry to a Lie group. And the first one that comes to mind is the Heisenberg group. And so the Heisenberg group uh, is uh, D copies of uh, complex numbers and then uh, times the real numbers with this group law. So the, this, is a, this is a Lie group, and its Lie algebra is, is spanned by these vector fields. So maybe I'm, I'm <coughs> just going to flash the formulas without uh, going too deeply into, into uh, what they mean. And there is a natural Laplacian, which is attached to uh, these vector fields, and which is attached to the uh, Heisenberg group. And so this is... A, very important uh, uh, example uh, that was uh, studied by, by, by Stein and then by, by a number of uh, mathematicians. It's an instance of a non-commutative group. It's also an instance of uh, subriemannian geometry and uh, the, uh, the structure is, is not isotropic as opposed to what you see in Euclidean space, of course. So this is an interesting uh, example in itself, but it also has uh, fundamentally uh, interesting features. Uh, and so uh, what Isabel set, set out to do with uh, Hajar Bahuri uh, was to uh, find the analogs of all these uh, fundamental results of a real uh, or Euclidean harmonic analysis uh, to find what, what they do become in this uh, more general uh, case. So I, I, I don't cite exactly uh, the result that they obtain, uh, but they develop a uh, little bit Paley theory adapted to uh, the Heisenberg group, uh, sobel Fermatic theorem, Picard's estimates, uh, Fourier restriction. There are other authors who, who looked at that uh, such as uh, Muller earlier, uh, but their work was really fundamental in, in developing uh, all of these aspects. And just like uh, the uh, analog theorems uh, were very fundamental in the Euclidean case and, and found a, a huge number of applications, uh, this will uh, no doubt lead to uh, very, very uh, important uh, developments. So with this, I conclude, and Isabel, congratulations. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this very nice insight uh, into the work of Isabel.